Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session looking at Hercules Oteus or Hercules on Oeta or Eta. Uh, I don't know. I never know how to pronounce these things. Uh, sometimes I'm pretending I don't know and sometimes I just don't know. It's a not Seneca, Seneca uh, translation, so it's probably not by actually Seneca. It's more in the style of Seneca, but uh, they thought it was by Seneca when they translated it in 1566. And by they, I mean John Studley uh, as part of this uh, ongoing uh, sequence of looking at Seneca tragedies. Uh, this uh, uh, is I say uh, originally printed in 1566 and then with uh, nine other mostly Seneca uh, plays in translation uh, republished in 1581 as a compilation of his 10 tragedies and we're completing our journey through these first look at all of these uh, these important translations because they did have an impact uh, on uh, on the the drama of the time um, uh, either being read in the original Latin or uh, just popularised uh, by being published in translation here. And say we're going to have a saunter through this particular text in two sessions. We normally rush through our Senecas, uh, but this one is this one's a mighty text, so we get two sessions to go through it. Um, and we will have a little bit of time to discuss as we go. So reading Hercules and Hylus today is... Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu, and I'm an author based in Romford. Uh, reading Iole is... Bryony Sparrow, actor in Lincolnshire. Uh, reading Dianara, or Dianera, or something similar, is... Hi, I'm Lynn. I'm uh, a teacher between teaching terms right now, coming to you from California, USA. Uh, reading Nutrix is... Hi, I'm Eric, and I care about your tech problems. I don't care about other things. <laughs> and uh, reading chorus is... Alan in Suffolk. Can someone sneak me pom-poms? Uh, <laughs> and I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be, I would say I will be reading stage directions. There are almost no stage directions. I will occasionally note when there may or may not be a new scene. Uh, and on which point we will go forward and open Act 1. Act 1, uh, arguably Scene 1, uh, though it may just be the only scene, uh, uh, which appears with Hercules alone. O oh, Lord of ghosts, whose fiery flash that forth thy hand doth shake, doth cause the trembling lodges twain of Phoebus' car to quake, Rain reachless now in every place thy police procured I have. Aloof where Nereus locks up land impaled in winding wave. Thwack not about with the thunder thumps, the rebel kings be down. The ravening tyrants with Sepsilus are pulled from their crown. By me all daunted is whereon thy bolts thou shouldst bestow, and yet, O oh Father, yet the heavens are still withheld me fro. At all assays I serve, as might an imp of Jove behoove, and that thou ought to father me, my stepdame well doth prove. Why dost thou linger in delay? Is heaven of us afraid? Seem we so awful, fell and fierce, and wherefore are we stayed? And cannot Atlas boisterous back on stooping shoulder tough, uphold the peace of Hercules and heaven well enough. What is it, sire? What is it, Jove, that thee so much deters? What may thee force keep back thy son from scaling off the stars? For death hath let me pass again from dungeon dark to thee, when mischiefs fell and monsters all destroyed and spoiled be that either land or seas or air or hell engender could arcadian lion none to range in salvage nemea would the stimful fowl hath chased been with bow and brazel bolt no nimble heart of menelaus doth lie in hill or halt the dragon daunting with his blood hath gorged had gorged the golden grove and hydra hath his courage called and diomedes drove whose puffed paunches pampered were with store of strangest blood that scored the coast and barren banks of cruel Haber flood. I slaughtered them, and that the force of foe might well be seen, I prowled away the booties of the proud Amazon queen. Of silent shades in glummy gulfs the dreadful dooms I saw, 
On Serba black the Tartar, Tyke, the sun did shine with ore. And he with steaming goggle eyes hath gullied upon the sun, and tears yawns and gapes no more, whose gasping breath to dun. Affront his altars bitter, fell was knocked unto the ground by him whose hand gave Gerion his deep and deadly wound, and slew the mighty bull that was two hundred hearts adread. All noyous plagues I have spoiled, I spoiled have that ever tell us bread. And daunted by my hand they lie, the gods now need not free. The world to answer Juno's ire, no monsters now can get. Now show thy valiant son his sire, or set him in the clouds. Thou shalt not need to be my guide, myself will climb the shrouds. Do thou my passage but allow, and I shall find a way. But if thou dread that monsters more the earth engender may, hast on each monster hideous to show itself in time, while Hercules hath his abode beneath the heavenly clime. For who encounter shall the fiends, who is that Grecia hath? that may be meet to buy the brunt of mighty Juno's wrath. My praise hurts not my health, my fame doth fly from land to land. The icy pole doth know me where the northern bear doth stand. The easterlings encumbered with the gleed of scorching sun, the south where Phoebe by crooked clear of tropic crab doth run. In every coast, O Titan, where thou dost thyself to reveal, how I have met thee face to face, to thee I do appeal. Aloof beyond the compass of thy light I set my foot, and never could thy blaze so far his glimpse in glory shoot, as I have forced the honour of my triumphs for to stretch. The day itself hath had his stint within my travel's reach. Dame nature failed, the world was shoved beside his centre dew, and ugsome night in shimmering shade from dungeon dark I drew. And cankered chaos, a lodged aloof, encountered me amain. Yet from the deep I gap to ground, whence none returns again. We strave against the sea storms, the ocean storms. I ballast the keel, fraught with my weight, that wrestling waves could not compel it real. What heaps of hazards tempted I through all the open air, to qualify thy wedlocks, <clears throat> wrath can mischief none repair. The earth would loathe such baggage bred as I would match my might. Yea, <clears throat> yea, monsters none are to be found. The fiends do shun my sight. And Hercules, for want of fiends, against himself did rage. What elvish creatures cursed did I with naked arm assuage? Was ever any peevish thing so big upon the ground? that co with me, but that my hand alone did it confound. Not hitherto from vermin vile through fainting fear I leapt. In babish years, not when to me in cradle they laid they leapt. Each thing that was commanded me at ease I did obey. Thus free from painful toil to me, they never passed a day. What vermin have I vanquished, no king commanding it? My courage cloys me more than all the wiles of Juno's wit. But what availeth me to rid mankind of fickle fear? The gods yet cannot reign in rest, while up the world doth peer. New rid of furious fiends, it sees aloft in starry skies. The cruel creatures all that erst on earth did fall arise. Dame Juno hath transport the elves, the scorching crab doth creep. About the burning zone, and loof at Africa doth keep. The tropic line and harvest fat he feeds with parching heat. To Virgo, Leo turns the time, and in a reeking sweat, he bustling up his burning mane, doth dry the dropping south, and swallows up the slabby clouds in fiery foaming mouth. The urchins all are crept to skies and have prevented me. I conqueror from earth to heaven, my travels all may see. These gargle faces grim on heaven, door Juno first did set, as though thereof the terror might to skies my passage let. Although she scatter them in skies, or make the heavens forlorn, more than the earth or helic gulfs, whereby ye gods are sworn. Yet room for Hercules shall be made, if after monsters quells. 
or battles fought, or hell like hound in chains as captive held. If all exploits cannot prevail in skies a place to gain, then souped up be the Midland Sea twixt Barbary and Spain. That either shore may join in one with channel none between, there will I dam the running stream that sea shall none be seen. Or as for Corinth outshot land that tween two seas doth lie, it shall give way to either stream that through the same shall fly. And when the seas on passage have the fleet of Athens town, may float in channel new, thus shall the world turn topsy down. Let Ister turn his stream and Tineus slow another way. Grant Jove a placket, grant whereby the gods uphold I may. Discharge thy thunder dint, where I shall keep due watch and ward. If either to the icy pole thou bid me have regard, or burning zone, here let the gods fall safe or false defy. Prince Paean purchased hath an house amid the crystal sky, and well deserved he the temples of Parnassus hill, for slaughter of a dragon maid, how oft recovering still in hydra poison python lay, with Bacchus Perseus strong, by less than less desert than Hercules, have crept the gods among, but all the east a mighty coast to bond is brought by him. Whom Juno spites, how stern a bug was snaky gorgon grim. What imp is he begot between my stepdame Dyer and thee? Whose praised pains have purchased him a place in heaven to be. The heaven that on my shoulders I have hosted up I crave. But Lycus, partner of my pains, dispatch a triumph, triumph brave. Display in pomp the ruin of Orisius house and crown and for the sacrifice with speed strike yet the bullocks down. Whereas the IRA that doth advance the church of Sene Jove lies open to the Eubora sea that wrathful wave doth move. The gods in bliss that man doth count avail that can at once both grave and glory gain. Death upon death, the wise doth him assail whose wretched life is lingered on in pain. With frowning fate in spurning spite who strives and sets the keel of gaping gulf at naught, will not submit his captive hands to gives as dish of dishonour in triumph to be brought. My careful caitiff, he shall never droop, whelmed in storming thoughts of sour annoy, whose stomach scorns the daunting death to stoop. Through seas, amid the deep in hoisted hoy, drive him aloof, when as a, a southern gale beats Boreas back, or eastern puff again recoils the western wind, and seems to hail from deeper sands the surges torn in twain. The broken planks to catch, he scrambles not, or racked bark, as one that hopes to have amid the chow deep a landing plot. When dismal death appears in every wave, he cannot ship, suffer shipwreck all alone. With pined careening course and streams of tears, and with our country dust our heads upon, holdering our locks, we languish out our years. <clears throat> Neither flashing flame nor thump thumping thunder crack will once daunt us, O death thou dost pursue, where fortune forms, but where she worketh rack, Thou shunnest those that would thee not askew. We stand not in on our raised country wall, whose ground shall now be o'ergrown, alas, with bramble and briar and down the temples fall, while mucky sheep coats are planted in their place. And now the frosty freak face Greek, alas, this way, this way, with all this drove of meat, by so much of Achilia must pass as heaped on ashes gloweth still with heat. The Thessaly shepherd, sitting by the way, on jarring pipe shall play his country rhyme, singing with sighs a lack and well a day. Thus to bewail the sorrows of our time, ere time shall roll the race of many a year. It will be asked where us the town did stand. A well was I, when I as lived a Lear, not in the barren vaults of fallow land, nor in Thessaly on the footless cliffs, 
but now among tracky, craggy rocks and ugly shrubs, necessity me drives, whose flaming tops detar the fading ox, and in the way, less woods untrod before, all comfortless, affright, and in a maze, needs I must trot alone, that would abhor the savage beasts, that on the moon, mountains graze, a better lot, if any dames may have, they over in, in each wandering stream shall row, or shroud in desert walls, westmen wave, with feeble force of shallow ford doth flow. The haughty Hercules mother here was wed. What Scythian crag, what stones engendered him, what rocky mountain or rudape they bred, a tyrant titan's race accursed limb. Steep Athos hill, the brutish Caspian land, with teat unkind, fed thee twixt rock and stone. False is the tale wherewith thou bearst in hand. Two nights for thee, thy mother dear, did groan, while lingering stars long lodged in purple sky. The shepherd star his course did interchange with the lone star, and up the moon doth sty. That couched Phoebe durst not the welkin range. No lance can pierce his monster's ruggy skin. The blunted iron tried it with the thumping thwack, thwack and steel, not so tough on naked skin. The sword was brassed, the stones rebounded back. The force of fate he utterly defies, and toughly timbered as he is of limb. He does contrive how quarrels may arise that death might prove his feeble force in him. Quarries could not enter to his flesh, nor yet the bow with Scythian steel drawn deep. No, nor the glaze with which Sarmesian fresh hot skirmishes in the icy clime keep. No, nor the Parthian better arch afar than Crete, who parched with fate and sauntering flame under the equinoctial rays of war against the easterling discomforting the same. He with his body did batter down the wall of Ocali. Nothing may with him withstand. By valiant prowess he hath conquered all. Tis one before that he doth take in hand. The Haugi Pariah that fifty paunches had, the forty geeks with hundred arms likewise, that clam up Thessaly hills as giant mad. When rebels' rage would take from Jove the skies, such steaming eyes, such ghastly visage foul, such gargle face, such countenance glaring grin, where wherewith stern Hercules glowingly doth scowl, those giants had resembling plainly him. Thus greatest bliss is prone to greatest bale. There wants no woe whose cup we have not taste. We wretched women have with countenance pale. And into a second scene for Act One, enter Iole. But careful caitiff, I do not bewail forlorn the sweeping flames, nor idols with their tattered temples torn, nor that the fathers burn together with their sons, that gods and men, that tombs and church at once to ruin runs. Upon the common care we do not pour our plaint, for fortune wills us turn our tears with other woes attaint. And thus my frowning face allotteth unto me another kind of wretchedness that must lamented be, that what shall I first beweep, or chiefly what complain, and to bewail them all at once would mitigate my pain. Alas, that but on breast Dame Nature did me frame, that blows agreeing to my grief might bounce upon the same with weeping sipil rock bruise ye may bruise ye my baleful breast or on eridanus silent shore in sorrows let we rest whereas the morning troop of nymphs do hail their hairs to wail the death of phaeton with showers of dropping tears or else in sicil rock cause me in couch to dwell where Scylla hag with howling noise and barking big doth yell, or else in linnet's shape let me let me tell on my tale and weep with Adon in the woods 
or turned to nightingale, as Lady Philomel records with weeping lay, in shade of haughty Ismar Hill upon a tender spray, with soaking sighs her grief, O oh gods, and me adite, in shape that may be suitable, unso my plaintive plight, and of my piteous moan let craggy tracking sound, Sith mirror saw the tears where in Dame Venus' eyes were drowned, that she for Adonis with smoky sighs did shed, and Halcyon might wail at will her loving Saex dead. The lady Teotalis get life to weep alone, and Philomel did change her shape, and earnfully did moan, her tender it is death, alas, why are not yet with flickering feathers fit for wings, my naked arms beset. O oh, happy shall I be, and happily be blessed, when in the woods, as in a house, I make my shrouding nest, and sitting like a bird upon my country ground, in doleful harmony shall tune the cares that me confound, that thus the people fond may talk how they have seen, in piteous likeness of a bird, the daughter of a queen. I, careful caitiff, I beheld my father's fate, when in the court a deadly club did pale him on the pate, and sprawling on the floor, with brains pashed out he lay, as if fates would let thy course be shrined in pit of clay. What flowing tears, O sire, would I on thee bestow, and could I brook it, Toxius, to see thy death with woe? that wert unwaned in years, and eke in pits unpazed, upon whose naked cheeks the pregnant sap no hairs had raised. Why should I, parents dear, your fates with tears detest, whom death, with hand indifferent, hath taken hence to rest? My fortune seeks my tears, due is mine own distress. Now as a captive must I dance attendance, more or less, upon my lady's rock and twist her thread i spun woe worth woe worth my beauty for the witch in dread of death i run and for thy sake alone my stock hath lost his life and while that my sire denieth me to hercules as his wife and did for fear refuse his stepfather to be but to our lady's baleful bower as kept captives hence go we and they clear and that ends act one so yeah we've got one of those let me tell you my life story acts of uh yeah hercules coming on and just doing yeah i've done some stuff and then at the very end of hercules's speech going oh yeah there's some stuff that could someone go and do the thing that sets up the plot that would be really good um so it's like we get about six lines of plot maybe only five um and then i say huge amounts of stuff um uh chorus uh, i think eric was putting this in the chat of just doing geography lessons um a lot of lot of that uh, uh and then we get this uh, uh his um uh, hercules uh, uh love interest as it were who is uh uh here and uh, uh and not necessarily a great place um uh there and um yeah because hercules is uh, uh has has done some conquering um of a city and the country there about um and uh, yeah wants to bring away his his uh, his his love um he does have a wife though so this might go badly uh, might go badly and I got, gleaned all of that from the argument. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure the text is really helping us in glean all of those details because the, there's so little actual exposition within all of that stuff. There's some nice stuff in there. There's also a lot of stuff in there. Um, yeah, that was that was a tough one. Uh, Alan. Yeah, one, I'm just wondering, was this actually written for the for performance or for private reading? Oh, again, private reading. I mean, it's right. it's 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 not. It, it is something that we, if we were to do it, we would be looking at either a severe adaptation or just on the textual interest note uh, side of things. It's not one where we're going, "Hi, let's let's put all the bells and whistles on this one," um, because um, yeah, of, of all of all the Seneca slash non non Seneca um, texts, it's 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 the 
the hardest one because if, if nothing else it's the longest yeah the, the other thought i had was that ioli's speech there bounces along in basically rhyming couplets but i just could not work out what the rhyming scheme of big speech pattern should be for the chorus it seemed to be all over the damn place uh, veil, gain, assail, pain, strives, gives, not brought, droop. No, it seems to be um, A B A B. Um, there might be a cage. It might, might, it might, there might be a C somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, it seems to be there. Just maybe that the um, shift in pronunciation may have uh, struck, Changed and, and it, some yeah. modernisation may have slightly knocked some of them uh, slightly to one side. He's also a bugger for alliteration. Yeah, thumping thwack. I yes. like a thumping thwack. <laughs> Keep your private life out of this, Robert. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of that of, uh, going in. He's, he's, he's got a bit of that. Uh, other thoughts? Um, uh, Elizabeth and Eric... Yeah, I was just thinking, like, in those very, very long speeches, a lot was being said, but not that much about the plot. Mm. And then I, I haven't read the argument. I just caught the last two lines, just a spoiler myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I loved the sound of the words. I did, like, there was, like, one word was, like, powdering, powd powdering, something like that. And um, I just, I loved the sound of the words and the sound of the verse. They, it was really kind of like lulled you in. And I was like, okay, I'm not sure entirely what's going on, but I like the sound of it. Mm, yeah, and we've got a lot of 14ers here. So we have this this rhythm, which is quite yeah, difficult yeah. to work with. And I don't think, and I, I'm saying this off slightly off the top of my head, that John Studley is as good with the 14ers as some of the other Senecan translators. Um, I, I seem to recall there were one or two where they really gave us something that was really, really flowy, uh, whereas this one does feel like we're, we, we, we head to an end of a, of a line or every two lines and we sort of hit a... Uh, it, it sort of thumps a, a bit. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I think that's quite nice is also that just this early Elizabethan... Um, language that you're using that we are using word forms that are slightly odd, even though they they might be effectively very you know uh, relatively modern. Just because uh, we're using a reasonable amount of original spelling in this text, that that we're we're hitting these slightly different sounds. Uh, that is really nice. I think Elizabeth picks picks up on that. Um, so I'm 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 yeah. There's there's there's, there's something really interesting about it all, uh, Eric. Yeah, I, I I edited this text and I still don't. I I remember thinking I don't know what this is about. I don't. I, don't, I mean, the, like there are lovely sort of you know episodes of things that have happened to other people, like you know the whole transformation of um, oh, Philomel wow. and uh, Itis and all that stuff, and just kind of you know becoming the, the whole concept of you know I, I want to run away and become a bird so that I don't have to like deal with my problems. I mean that would be nice um if we could do it um yeah i don't know it's it's very pretty but you have to know a lot of mythology to know what you're saying otherwise it's kind of very dense yeah yeah there is that that is that problem i mean some of the other seneca translations have actually you can tell the translators worked quite hard to explain some of the stuff as they're going along as well and has even added the odd little bit just to, so you really know what the backstory means rather than just here's some mythologizing and yeah it, it it does just the pure density and the amount of it even if you know your mythology you sort of go uh, uh lynn uh, yeah i just wanted to note that not only does the rhyme scheme change in the chorus it's um pentameter instead of 14 syllables mm. so is is that would the audience have experienced, or the reader have experienced that as a newer form, and then the fourteen is more traditional, or were they were they basically kind of evolving in parallel, and it just to give it a little bit different sound? I kind of wonder what the significance of that ch choice that the translator made. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't really know. I suspect it's a sort of parallel thing. I I, I don't think you know that the. the there are there's a lot of experimentation going on because um, I I don't recall actually reading that many fourteeners much earlier than 
the sort of the early Elizabethan. I think there is some, but it does seem to be that you know in uh, around about the the fifteen sixties, there just seems to be an awful lot of different verse forms, almost in competition with each other, just going, yeah, duke it out, who's going to win? Um, and 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 they're really much more playful. I could be wrong on all of those points though, because um, I haven't been very systematic. <laughs> But no, it's a really good, good, good question of what what the authors are trying to do in terms of, um, you know, th what the original author was trying to do, but also what the translator is trying to do and uh, and, and for their particular audience. Um, OK, let's go into Act Two because we get some sustained dialogue. You know, it's not just speeches. People actually talk to each other in different ways. So let's <laughs> see if that works. So we have uh, Nutrix and Dianara. What furious fits of ramping rage doth boil in women's brain when one in roof, both wedded wife and harlot do remain? Both Scylla and Har Charybdis gulf, no danger like it have. The raging roll on Sicil shore by heaps the rattling wave. Nay, salvage beast, so bad there is that better is not the same. For Brute no sooner drew, blew abroad the captive harlot's name and that the beauty of Yola's countenance shine brim as the doth the day when marble skies no filthy fog doth dim or like the glimpse of twinkling star that in the welkin bright displays abroad his shooting beams amid the frosty night but Deanira, hercules wife old bedlam like doth stand and scowleth as the tiger wild which couched on the sand in shade of rock doth shroud his whelps and buskles up in haste Espying him that of his young doth come to make the waste, uh, or like as madness, uh, overcharged with Bacchus liquor sweet, with ivy bunch on thurlid dart from place to place doth fleet. She makes a pause in doubt to whereto she might direct her pace. Then, fanatically as one bestrode, she flicks from place to place in Hercules' house. Thus she was wrapped in rage of flaming ire. The house too narrow was to cool the desperate dame's desire. She runneth in, she trots about, she makes a sudden stay. The malady in frowning face itself doth play display. No galling grief remains at heart. The tears gush from her eyes, nor in one kind of temper still in frenzy fits, she flies. Her glowning looks with fury fell do charge her for me hue now glaring stand her steaming eyes and paleness doth ensue the ruddy color in her cheeks the anguish of her heart drives out her dolors deep to show themselves in every part she languisheth she moans for help she wails her froward fate and all this the house an echo makes resounding her estate so oh, headlong to and fro she hies and Running still about, goes mumbling in the secrets of her mind, she mutters out. O oh, Juno, spouse to Jove, what part of heaven soe'er thou keep, raise up some savage beast against lose, lewd Hercules to creep, that I shall think sufficient. If any cumbrous snake with breeding he do crawl, more big in all the slimy lake, that may not take a foil, or if that aught yet do remain, so ugsome, grisly, cursed and grim, so fraught with filthy bane that he may loathe to look thereon, that may his sight appall. Unto their dens from hideous holes procure such venom crawl. Or if that fiends can none be found, then coacher thou my ghost to what thou list. This soul of mine shall welt about the most. Some uncouth shape, some ghastly face, such one bestow on me, whereby the horror of my pangs may countervail it be. My boiling breast cannot conceive the vengeance I would try. Why searchest thou the corners far of lands aloof that lie, and turnest the world upside down? Why seekest thou the harms of hell to trounce him? Furious fiends enough within this breast do dwell. Make me thine instrument of hate, his stepdame I will be. And thou mayst work the overthrow of Hercules by me. Appoint my hand to anything. Why dost thou make delay? Use thou my frenzy as the means to compass his decay. The mischief shall be brought to pass whate'er thou wilt crave. Why stand ye musing still thereon? 
contrived all I have. Thou mayest forbear thy malice now, thy rancor shall suffice to bring this wretch unto his end, myself can well devise. My foster girl of raving mind, these dreary plaints assuage. Forbear this heat and bridle yet the rigor of thy rage. Behave thyself for such an one as men may worthy judge, the noble spouse of Hercules. Shall Italy, slavish drudge, bring bastard brethren to my babes? Of her that is a slave, shall Jupiter, the god of heaven, forsooth have a daughter have? The flashing flames and fighting floods shall join together first. The northern bear to marble seas shall stoop to quench his thirst. Yea, vengeance, vengeance will I have, though on thy back thou wield the boisterous heavens and all the world do peace unto thee yield. There is a thing shall sting thee worse than Hydra, the hissing snake, the coarse he cursed of angry wife, doth any fury flake, up thrown from Etna's boiling forge, so souse the beaten skies. More than all things that thou hast daunt, my ghost shall thee agrize. Shall thou prefer a servile troll before thy wedded wife? For fear of many monsters more, I tendered still thy life. And now, for to increase my care, I see no monsters lurk, and now steps in a hateful horror, which more my mind doth irk to cumber us as ill as fiends. O Father, that thou of might, the shield of gods, and Titan thou that burst the lamp of light, I only unto Hercules, a loyal wife, abode, and to an Harlot's use are turned my prayers made to God. The fruit of my felicity a strumpet doth obtain, and for an harlot's love ye gods have heard my prayers vain. Is Hercules returned for her? O oh, grief, nor not yet content, devise some tearing torments, torments, seek some pangs and punishment. Let Juno learn of me what force a woman's fury hath. She knows not how in deep despite to use her harming wrath. For me, you did these battles wage, and for my sake, Achilloe did let his streaming blood amid the wambling waves to flow. When snarling adder's shape he took unto the boisterous bull, he giving up his sloughy shape did bend his malice full, and thus Thou foil the thousand foes to conquest of this one. Yet presently thou art plunged, plunged art, and that by me alone. A prisoner now must be preferred before thy loyal wife. All none of that. But even the day that first begins this strife and to our wedlock brings the breach shall be thy dismal day and nap in twain the fatal twist wherewith thy life doth stay. What meanest this? My mind relents, my malice breaks its rage. O oh, wretched grief, why dost thou faint? Thou, thy spite wilt thou assuage? With fealty of a faithful wife dost thou thy conscience charge? Why lets thou not my boiling ire for to increase at large? Why dost thou slake? thy frying fits, this malady still survive. Even now I able was with him for mastership to strive. Indeed, I have not craved aid, yet step named Juno will to wield my hands to work his rack. Be here assistant still. What treachery intendest thou, my bedlam to commit? Now thy husband wilt thou murder, wretch? whose flaming fame doth flit from east to west, whose bright renown the earth could not contain, but raised the loft from marble skies, it doth rebound again. The, marble, the, the mother earth shall rise in arms for to revenge his grave. His former steps are stopped hereby the, over, the overthrow shall have, and all Aetolia royal blood will feel an utter, utter fall. In quarrel of thy Hercules, the world conspire shall. 
Then, silly wight, how many plagues shalt thou alone abide? But be it that from the face of man thou might thy body hide. Yet if Jove, the lightning leans of heaven, doth hold in armed hand, behold the firing, the flying fiery flakes in ranks all steady stand, and threatening thunders thumping thick do bounce out all the day. Death's dungeon that thou dost defy, full duly scare thee may. For there his uncle umpire sits, where thou mayest unespied, and everywhere thou shalt perceive the gods to him allied. I grant it, desperate deed, where to despair now doth me drive. Die, sure th thou shall. And die I will, as presently I live, the loyal spouse of Hercules. And ere this night do pass, they shall not see that day near a living widow was. Nor of my spousal bed and horse shall get the interest. The dawning day shall sooner make the morning peer in west until the eastward Indians, the icy pole, shall melt. And freezing Scythian shall first shall fry with flames that he hath felt of Phoebus' fervent wheel. Ere me, the Salia trolls shall see divorce. My bridal blaze shall be with blood equinched be. And either let him murder be or take away my life. So soothly, let him count among the foiled fiends his wife. Among Alcides' labors, let me be reckoned, let me reckon be as one. His loving heart I hold until the utter gasp be gone. And undivorced, not unrevenged, I will to Hercules' tomb, if Ily be with child by him, I'll tear it from her womb and rend it with these paws of mine. Yea, in the wedding place, I flying at her fierce will set my talents in her face. Let him not spare in ramping rage a sacrifice to make of me upon his wedding day when he his troll doth take, so that I falling down may light on Ily's senseless course. He dies a happy man that hath quelled his foes by force. O oh, wretched wight, why dost thou thus increase thy fuming heat and feed thy fury wittingly, least hap should be the defeat? He loves Lady Ioli, but while her father's crown stood flourishing in royal state and were not battered down, and as unto the king, daughter of a king, he suitor was. But when from the type of haughty pomp she did to throw them pass, he shook her off hot love was cooled. And now her bitter hail, bale would not allow the racked keel to bear too high a sail. Unleafful things that should be shunned we greedily desire, but matters meeter for our estate we seldom do require. The pitying of adversity doth oft enkindle more the fervent fits of love, and this perhaps er, doth urge him sore to see her reft of native soil it may fancy his it may his fancy touch, her hair not tucked with tresses trim, nor decked with golden humps. Perhaps the man with prick, pity pricked doth love her for her care. Unto his noble hearts to pity prisoners, tis not rare. The sister dear of Primus, fair lady Hesione, he did cause to tell him on the Greek in wedlock knit to be, account how many wives before and maidens did he love and raged abroad to cool the rage the Venus brand did move. Fair Augie made of Arcady, intentive set to lead Diana's dance, by force of him did release her maidenhead, and yet no token could she show, nor pledge of any Jove. What shall I speak of any more, or doth it me behove, to prate what pranks he played with fifty daughters in one night? And yet how soon of such a pang he overcame the might. He set much store by on folly of Lydia Land the Queen, when like a guest on Tmolus the Mount he hath been seen. He was so pricked with Cupid's dart and caught in Venus' trap, that tucked in woman's weed he sat with distaff in his lap, and spun the flax with fumbling fist, and rudely thumbed the thread, and flung from him the lion's case, the price of noble deed. With tresses 
trick on with tresses thick on plated looks he locks he wailed as a maid with myrrh his frizzled poll was smeared and curled bush was braid thus everywhere as fancy flits the fondling dotes in love but in such sort as easily he can the same remove but they whom fickle fancies fits have taint do learn at last in link of love by tract of time to fix affiance fast well ye the he this captive queen and on whom he do see the daughter of his deadly foe will more esteem than thee as gladsome grows at prime of spring and beauty's pride are seen when freshest warmth the naked twigs doth clad in pleasant green but when could boreas boisterous blast the pipling puffs doth stop of south wind sweet rough winter powls the naked bushes top the bare wood with misshapen stumps to show a withered face. Even so, my beauty, marching forth a season on his race, still fades away and evermore abates his glimpsing gloss. And whatsoever was in me by care is come to loss. And that which erst by fancy fed the greedy gazing eyes is fallen away by bearing child, so oft it droops and dies. And since I came to mother's state, I faded fast away, and wrinkled age with furrowed face steps in with quick decay. And yet this bondmaid's feature fresh, her sorrow better brooks, her comely countenance crazy it is with lean and wanny looks. And yet for all her cark and care amid her deep distress, she bears a glimpse of beauty bright and favor nothing less. Her heavy hat and frowning rate can nothing from her pluck, save scepter from her royal hand by all his lowering luck. By means of this first fainting fear did lodge within my breast that makes me wake the weary nights and lease my kindly rest. In all men's eyes at first I seemed to be a blessed wife and ladies all at our estate repining very rife did wish my match in spite of fate. What step, sire, shall I hope as match in majesty to Jove within the heavenly cope? Dear foster dame, whom I shall make my fear in spousal bed, although you wrist that Hercules to all these toils hath led, do link with me my bridal bands, my state shall be impaired. Tis small worth to desire to be uh, to kingly wedlock reared. But issue is the thing that doth in marriage kindle love. And issue is the thing that doth in marriage malice move. This well the bond made to thee for present shall be brought. Lo, he jetteth up and down with princely port full hot and buckles fast about his loins the lively lion's case who doth invest the wretched with the right of kingly mace, Dis deposing those from honor's type that late so lofty sat, and pestereth his puissant paws with huge, unwordly bat, of whose exploits and martial acts the series sing aloof, and all enclosed in ocean seed thereof have perfect proof, is now become an amorous knight, the honor of his name doth nothing touch his conscience to tender once his fame. He roveth through the world as, as on that doth no wit esteem, although that man as soon to Jove shall him unworthy deem, nor like the man whose credit through the towns of Greece is great. He seeks to compass his desire to work a lover's feet with single dames in his delight. If any him deny, then to attain his lawless lust by rigor he doth try. With men he fareth frantically, to others smart and blame. He wins his wives, his folly frail is cloaked by virtue's name. The noble city Oikali is made a raised town. The sun twixt morn and even did set in one day up and down. One day did one day did it see stand in state 
The same did it see fall. These bloody broils and wasting wars of love proceeded all as oft as parents unto him deny their daughters dear, so oft I warrant them they need his wrathful fury fear. So oft a man with Hercules shall be at deadly food as he denies his stepfather to be by joining blood. If he may not be son-in-law, then doth he rage and rave. Why do these guiltless hands of mine still keep him from his grave? Till he dissemble frantic fits to bend his aiming bow and death wounds on my child and me with bloody hands bestow. Thus haughty Hercules was wont his wedlocks to, uh, to divorce. Yet not there is that law of guilt on him might have recourse. He makes the world blame Juno for his, his ills he hath commit. O rigor of my rage, why dost thou qualify my fit? Now must thou set thy hands on work to it while thy hands be hot. Thy husband wilt thou slay? Him whom his lame and lewd hath got. But yet he is the son of Jove. And so Alcmene's son. With stroke of steel? With stroke of steel, if it cannot be done, then for to bring his death to pass, I'll set for him a snare. What kind of madness may be that makes thee thus to fare? Such as my husband hath me taught. Will thou thy spouse destroy on whom the stepdame spite yet had no power to annoy? The wraths of heavenly minds do make them blessed on whom they light, so doth not spite of mortal men. O oh, silly, wretched, right, white, forbear thy rage and fear the worst. For man's force may not assail him that against the power of hell and death could not, could once prevail. I'll venture on the dent of sword. Thy wrath, dear foster child, is greater than the crime that hath thy Hercules defiled. With eagle malice measure faults, alas, why dost thou bring so great and sore penalty upon so small a thing? Let not thy grief be greater than the sorrow thou sustains. Set you it light that with our wedlock linked and harlot reigns? Nay, rather think it so too much that sorrow that doth thy sorrows breed. And is the love of Hercules revolt from thee indeed? Tis not revolt, dear foster dame, fast in my bones it sticks, but I are broils hot and burning breast when love to anger pricks. It is almost a common guise the wedded wives to haunt their husbands' hearts by magic art and the witchcraft to enchant. In winter could I charm to have the woods to make them sprout and force the thunder dint recoil that hath been bolting out. With watering surges have I shook the seas amid the calm. I smooth and tab the rustling waves and uh, lay down every wall. The dry ground gaped half like gulfs and out new springs have gushed. The roaring rocks have quaking stirred and none the threat thereat hath pushed. Hell gloomy gales I have brought up with, where grisly ghosts all hushed have stood and answering at my charm, the goblins grim have scolded. The threefold headed hound of hell with barking throats hath hold. Thus both the seas, the land, the heavens, and hell bow at my back. Now one day to midnight to and fro turns in my charming Jake. Yet at my enchantment, everything declines from nature's law. Our charm shall make his stomach stoop and bring him more and all. What herbs do grow in Pontesi or else on Pindus Hill to trounce this matchless champion? Where shall I find the ill? The magic verse enchants the moon from starry skies to ground. The fruitful harvest is thereby in barren winter found. The whisking flames of lightning gleams oft Sorcery doth stay, and noontime topsy turvy tossed doth dim the dusky day and leave the welcome to the stars, and yet not cause him stoop. The gods themselves, by charm of love, have caused the forest been to droop. Perhaps he shall be one by one, 
and yield to her the spoil, so love shall be to Hercules the last and latest toil. By all the host of heavenly powers, as thou seest me fear, the secrets that I shall attempt, and shall attempt in counsel see thou bear. What may it be that thou would, would have me keep so secretly? No broil of blades, no private coat, no fiery force per thee. I, you assure, I can conceal if mischief none be meant, for then the keeping close of it is sure a lewd intent. Then look about, if none be here, our counsel to betray, look round about, on all sides cast thy countenance every way. Behold, the place is safe enough from any listening ear. Beside the place of our estate, there is a secret nook, a covert corner for our talk that sunshine never took. Neither at morn nor eventide, when Titan's blaze doth quench, and he in ruddy western waves his fiery wheel doth drench. There secret lies the privy proof of Hercules' amorous thought. I'll tell thee all, dear foster dame, the witchcraft Nisus taught, whom Ixion engendered of a misty groaning cloud, when Pendus haughty hill high top among the stars doth shroud, and other stripe doth heave his crest about the riding rack, when Achelus overlaid with many a thumping thwack of Hercules' club, club did shift himself to every kind of shape, and trial made of all his slights, none served to escape. At length he turned himself into the likeness of a bull, and so was foully vanquished in form of horny skull. While Hercules, being conqueror, did me his wife enjoy. Returning home from Greece again, it happened, even lake, to overflow the drowned marsh and channel to forsake, and strongly stream to seas he runs and swells above his banks. And Nisus used to pass the pool and search the croaking cranks as ferryman demands his fare and bear me on his back and waiting through the break of waves and surges of the lake. At length, yet Nisus waded out unto the farther shore, yet Hercules had swam but half the river and no more and plied it hard to cut the stream. But when espied he had that Hercules was far behind, Madam, quoth he to me, be thou my booty and my wife, and clasping me about, away he flings, and Hercules bestirs him maugre wave. Though Ganges gulf and Lister stream, quoth he, thou traitor slave, might run it on, yet shift escape them both, well I could make, and in thy haste a shaft shall soon thy running overtake. And there he spake the word, his arrow flew out of his bow and wrought a wound on Nisus' ribs. He could no farther go. It sped him sure to look for death. He cried, well away. The baggage running from the wound reserved as he lay and putting it into his hoof, the which undoing, he in cutting it with his own hand, he gave it unto me. And thus the latter gasped, he, and thus at latter gasp, he said, the witches have me told that love may charm it be by this to have and keep his hold. The conning of which dame Michael did teach the Salia dames who only forced the moon to stoop to her from heavenly frames. Therefore, quoth he, at any time when hateful whores abuse thy, the, abuse thy spousal bed or wavering man do haunt when he stews, then with this salve anoint his shirts and let it see no sun, but keep it close in corners dark. The blood then shall not shun his strength. And thus full suddenly he left his talk with rest and deadly sleep or senseless death his feeble limbs oppressed. Thou dame to whom in hope of trust my secrets all be ray, on that the poison soaked unto the vesture bright, it may pre pierce through his limbs unto his heart and sink through every bone. I will dispatch it all in haste. Make thou thy earnest moan unto the God whose tender hand his steadfast guards doth wield. 
I thee beseech that art of earth and heaven in honor held, and thou that shakest burning bolts, thou cursed and cruel boy, whose elvish weapons make thy mother fear thy sharp annoy, now arm thy hand with speedy shaft, not of the slender sort, but biggest bolts with which as yet thou hast assault no fort. We need no little shaft that may stir Hercules to love. Bring cruel hands and force thy, and force thy how his deepest draught do prove. Now, now draw forth thy shaft wherewith thou caused cruelly the burning breast of Jove by fits of fervent love to fry. When as God his thunderbolt and lightning lay aside, gan foam the bumps on his forehead big and through the waves he hid and swam with Europe on his back in shape of horny bull. Now power down love and therewithal let Hercules heart be full. If Iole's beauty rekindle heat and Hercules heart doth move, quench thou these coals and force him glow with us in lawful love. Full off the thunder thumping Jove hath stooped to thy yoke, and him that wields the moory mace of black a burn to smoke. By flames in force, and eke the lord of glummy Stygian lake, but only match thou Hercules, and of him triumph take. O Jove, whose wrath more wrackful is than ireful Juno's might. The charm is made, in perfect force is all our medicine right. Wherein the shirt shall be steeped, shall steep it be that wearied many white. Whose hands on Pallas distaff spun the weary web with pain, and it for Hercules avail shall drink up all the vein. And with my charm I'll strengthen it, but lo, ye in the nick, deft Lycus cometh here at hand, who will dispatch it quick. But tell it not what force it hath, least he the guilt betray. So, in theory, Lycus has arrived at some point around here. Alas, that faith the kings dwells not in houses of estate. Have Lycus here the shirt, the which my hands have spun of late? While Hercules, at random robes, <laughs> and overshot with wine, does rudely dandle on his lap that Lydian lady fine. Now dotes he after Iole. But this, his boiling rage that burneth in his breast, I will with courtesy assuage, for courtesy conquers cankered churls. See thou my spouse desire, he spare the shirt until he set the frankincense on fire and offer up his sacrifice to wear his garland gray of poplar boughs on wreathed locks. And I will go my way to the royal gods and will bespeak the cruel Cupid's dame. Yet ye ladies and companions, that with me hither came, hither came. Now force the fountains of your tears from watery eyes to run, to wail our country Caledon on every side undone. Uh, we can infer they exit, leaving us with the chorus. O Delanir, dear daughter of our king, Aeneas late, to see thy frowning fates, woe after woe thus down on thee to fling. It irks our hearts that were thy foster mates. O woeful wight, it pitieth us to see thy wedlock in this terrible state to be. We, lady, we that with thee wanted were, with flapping oar on Achilles to row, when having passed the springtime of the year, with channel smooth he newly waxed low, and makes again his swelling surges calm, and boobling runs at ebb without and warm. Through weal and woe, we still with thee remain, and now what grief soever thou fearest in mind, account us that thou us as partners of thy pain. Commonly when fortune turns the wind, and makes thee bear thy burden, to beat my beaten sail but low, when friendship ends where before it did flow. And whoso guides the sway of golden mace through people thick to haunt his stately court, and in at a hundred gates to crease apace. Yea, though that thou maintain so great a port, 
to guard thee with its garrison it shall thou shalt scarcely find one faithful heart of all in painted porch and gates of gilded bowers the lurking hag erin her tusks doth wet and stirring strife with pouring quarrelling face she lowers the portly doors no sooner open set but treason black pale envy deep deceit with privy knife of murder step in straight and when the prince appears in open place to show himself before his subject's sight swelling despite attendeth on his grace as oft as dawning day removes the night and every time the sun at west goes down they look another man should claim the crown few hearts love kings not few their kingly might the glorious show of curtly countenance bewitcheth many where one sets his delight how next the king he may himself advance that through high streets he may as lord of rule with lofty looks ride mounted on his mule ambitious heat inflames his haughty breast another would his greedy hunger staunch with gums of gold and though he, he it possessed which araby serves not his pining paunch nor western india a world for to, be, to behold metagus flows with streams of glittering gold the covetous charl the greedy gnoff indeed in whom from cradle nature so it plants no hoarded heaps his endless hunger feed in plenty pines the rich in wealth he wants some other fondlings fancy thus doth guide to fawn on kings and still in court to bide as one disdaining like a country moam and a crooked clown the plough to follow still although the ding thrift daily keep at home a thousand drudges that his land do till yet wants his will and wishes wealth therefore only to waste on other men the more and other cloreth and flattereth fast the king by climbing up to tread down every white and some at least to block and feast to bring thus he strives to arm himself with might in blood but of their ship doth fortune fail when safe they think to float with highest sail who moon at morn on top of fortune's wheel high swayed hath seen a fullness of renown the glading sun hath seen his sceptre reel and him from high fall topsy-turvy down at morn full merry blithe in happy plight but whelmed in woes and brought to bail ere night these seldom meet hoary hairs and happy days the law that lies on stately crimson bed sleeps more in fear than snoring drudge that lays upon the country clod his drowsy head in golden roofs and haughty courts they keep whose dreadful dreams to make them start in sleep the purple robes lie waking many a night and slumbers not when homely rags do rest oh if as a gate the greatest spy we might the sorrows shrined in a prince's breast what pangs, what storms, what terror, oh, what hell, in sighing hearts or proud estates that dwell. The Irish seas do never roar so rough when rustling waves and swelling surges rise that hoisted are with sturdy northern puff, as fearful fancy do their mind agrise. But he sighs not, nor cumbers his with care, whom fortune hath bequeathed to send a share wooden dish and black beech bowl he swills and heaves it not to mouth with quaking hand with homely fare his hungry maw he fills and leers not back for fear of those that stand with naked swords but kings in golden cup wine blipped with blood most dreadful draughts do sup in dainty dish the poison bait is laid and treason lurks amid the sugared wine as every bit they quake and are afraid the sword will fall that hangs for butter by a twine and ever as he lifts his head and drinks the rebel's knife is at his throat he thinks such flattering joys these happily worldlings have 
the outward pomp, pretendeth lusty lives, when inwardly they droop, as doth the slave, that pines in pangs, fast clogged in golden gyves, strive not in haste to climb the whirling wheel, the hasty climbers oft in haste do reel. Mean dames defy both peerless and glittering spanges, and golden chains with rubies rich beset, nor at their eyes, ears do massy jewels hang, with turkey stones, nor pranked proud they jet in murray gowns, nor doth the wool they wear of crimson dye the costly colour bear, neither in tissue nor silken garments wrought with needle, nor embroidered robes they got, and yet this state is free from jealous thought, their wedding is not unto them their woe, when thousand storms in ladies' hearts do dwell by wedlock breach that breeds their noisome hell. Whoso he is that shuns the middle way shall never find false footing anywhere. The wilful lad that needs would have a day and weighty charge of father's chariot bear. While he from wanted ways his jade doth jaunts among strange stars, they pricky forward prance enforcing them with fever's flames to fry, whose roaming wheels refuse the beaten rut. Thus spoke himself and all the crystal sky, in peril of the southering fire he put. So haughty minds that climb above their skill, do work their own decay and others ill, while Daedalus, in flying through the air, to keep the midst between the sky and ground, he could in safe to Italy and gave no gulf his name by being drowned. But Icarus presumes to mount on high, and strives above the feathered flowers to fly, and scorns, look, and scorns the guiding of his father's train, and in his flight will cope to lofty sun, which melts his wings so down he drops again into the seas, whereby his name they won. Thus proud attempts of haughty climbing higher, receive shrewd falls to quit their fond desire. Let other mount aloft, let other soar, as happy men in great estate to sit. By flattering name of Lord, I set no store, but under shore my little keel shall flit. And from rough winds my sails fain would I keep, lest I be driven into that dangerous deep. Proud fortune's rage doth never stoop so low as little rose. But then she overflies and seeks amid main seas her force to show on Argosies, whose tops do reach the skies. But lo, here comes Our Lady Delanere, straight of her wits and full of furious ire. Uh, and which indeed we'll get to in a moment. Uh, furious ire. Yes, so there's a certain amount of um, murdery plotting going on here. It's always nice to have some murdery plotting. Um, I, I, I'm quite keen on it as a as a general a general thing. They they there's a lot of text about setting that up. And uh, once again, when you actually get to the actual plot, it's like it's, they're not spending enough time unpacking that plot. There's some nice nice interesting ideas. Um, uh, it's, yeah, new tricks is uh, is quite slow on the action, but uh, once it really kicks in, you know, thy husband wilt thou slay? Yes, yes, that's the plan. That's the plan that we have in mind. Planning to slay my husband, because um, uh, he's a yeah, um, he, he is the son of Jove. Yes, that's the reason. Like like father, like son, probably. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, Lynn. Yeah, I'm only familiar with this episode in the Hercules Legend secondhand. I haven't read any of the drama. Um, but it's it's interesting to me that um, Daenerys is characterized as angry and vengeful and Iole is characterized as a troll and a whore because that's not how I understand it. I mean, it's perfectly normative for conquering heroes to take concubines and for their legitimate wives to tolerate that. Um, and, you know, in, in the telling of the, the, you know, the secondhand telling of the story that I'm familiar with, um, Daenerys is not really angry, she's just heartbroken. And she, she honestly believes that this, this the blood of Nisus will make her husband love her again. She, you know, so is this plotting to kill him thing in the Latin? Or is that 
an edition of the translator and also characterizing his concubine as, as, as somehow a, a, using that loaded language like whore and troll. That I think must be the translator, but, but I, I don't know for sure. Uh, in terms of substantive plot changes, no, there aren't any. He's, he's being relatively accurate. In terms of lo loading of language, that I don't know. Um, I would not be surprised if uh, uh, the translator might be taking some liberties there. But I don't think, uh, certainly I don't think there's any, any uh, structural changes to, to what's going on mm. here. Um, yeah, it, it, it does. It feels to me like they're just going. Hi, Medea went down well. Let's do something almost exactly the same, um, but yeah, longer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that makes total sense to me. That that the, the you know the, the the sensationalism of the vengeful wife was was popular with readers. So let's tweak the Daenerys story to give it that tone mm. when maybe originally it didn't in the, in the Greek version. I don't know. Eric's our classicist. What says he? No pressure, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Uh, as far as I know, there are actually various versions. There's some versions where like, she knows that she's going to kill him with Ness's blood. And in some other versions, she doesn't. It's sort of like um, because Nessus tells her uh, that um, it's just going to make him make Hercules love her deeper, basically. Um, so it depends on which version you're reading. Um, yeah, learned something today. So. Mm. Yeah, uh, and once again, um, uh, we've got um, some geography and some nature classes with the chorus. Um, nature walks with chorus. <laughs> Lynn. The thing I thought was in interesting, and I'm not sure what is going on here, is this sort of long disquisition on a you know critique of of. Uh, excessive ambition like what does that have to do with anything the, mm. the chorus this whole thing about you know people who like lust after gold and lust after power and try to be king when they shouldn't be king and you know Icarus flying too high it's like this sort of general critique of, of excessive ambition like what does that have who who is that pointed at in this story mm. uh, Alan I think the chorus is writing in grey ink mm. That may not be a reference that applies in the Americas, but yeah. proverb, proverbially green ink is for nutters. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I suppose that there is a, you know, in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, tangentially in the sense of Hercules is, is a is a leader of people and he's in charge and, you know, maybe they're trying to link this to some sort of prideful fall thing. Um, that's why he's, you know, I suppose he is trying to have his cake and eat it a bit here. Um, so that that sort of does fit fit that a bit. Uh, Eric? Well, it is kind of basically similar to the Agamemnon Clytemnestra story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, the way it's written here, at least, where you've got the sort of uh, jealous wife who's been left at home and has to deal with sort of uh, her husband coming back with prisoners who are basically, or captives who are basically sort of nobles in their own country. And, you know, he wants them, yeah, he, he, he might be attracted to them. Um, also, I guess it's important to note that they sort of, she doesn't have proof that he's actually attracted to her. He kind of, I mean, like Yoli has said that he loves me, but then, like, he's he, with her father gone, he, she's more vulnerable, basically, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, whereas Hercules hasn't appeared to make a move just yet, <laughs> at least not on his own part. Mm. Yeah, and, and he does sort of highlight the, the, the fact that these myths are recycling the same themes and ideas again and again and again and again, just with slightly different characters. Um, you know, that there, there is... This uh, sort of uh, compulsive quality to it, uh, which is partly because you know the, the, they just get muddled, and the you know stories can be applied to different people, even though it's basically the same story, and the, the, the that sort of weird evolutionary nature of how the stories come to be collected and and, and different um, traditions uh, remain in place. So um, yeah, 
we have Act 3 to get through. So, um, a shorter Act. Act 2 was long. Uh, this one is broken up into, uh, again, uh, so a bit more. Uh, they're still long speeches, but they're, they're, again, uh, so, so some actual exchange between people. Uh, we should have a sort of short opening scene out of Act 3. Uh, uh, Dianera and Chorus actually talk to each other. Chorus said uh, uh, Dianera is uh, coming on, and indeed she does. Uh, okay. Alas, through all my quivering joints of running, fear doth rest. My staring hair stands stiff upright, and in my quaking breast deep terror dwells, and eke my heart with dread amazed doth pant, and swelling veins my liver beats, as when the wind doth want assuaged in calmy day. And yet the raging seas do roar, whose wrestling waves were raised aloft by southern blasts before. So yet my wits be toxicate, although my fear be gone. Thus God turmoils us when he means to cloy the unhappy one. Those proud attempts be dashed at length. O oh, wretch, O oh, careful white, what mischief may it be wherewith thou art so sore a fright? The shirt with niece's blood and brood no sooner hence was sent, and wretched woman that I am, to the closet straight I went. My mind mistrusts, I know not what, and treason doth surmise, and niece's by the heat berayed that tainted was the blood. The god foreshowed that here the force of all the treason stood, for by the good hap, the foaming gleed, no foggy cloud doth dim, but with full power of burning beams, he shining, he shined blazing brim. Scant yet I can for feeble fear unlock my fastened jaws, the scorching heat doth dry away, and up by force it draws the soaking blood that being laid amid the frying flame and boiling heat of shining sun did shrink before the same, wherein the shirt was steeped, and all the royal robe imbrued, I cannot show the villainy wherewith it was endued. For as the eastern wind doth force the winter snow to melt, or lukewarm south, when in the spring from Minas Mount they swelt, as Lucas else, that frontiers on Ionian sea, a land doth break the wave, the beaten surge lies foaming on the strand, or by the warmth of heavenly heat, the frankincense doth drop. So all the venom wastes away and melteth every crop. And while I wonder still here on, the wonder shrinks away and with a froth, it spots the ground and there the poison lay, it rots the cloth. My woman bone and swelled doth follow me and shakes her head. My son, as one astonished I see, and hying hither in all haste, declares what news ye bring. And Hylus enters to Dynera and Nutrix. Go, mother, go. Seek out aloof if place of biding dwell. Beyond the ground, both gulf and stars, beyond both heaven and hell. Fly, mother, far beyond the bounds of Hercules, his toil. My mischief great, I know not what within my breast doth boil. Unto the royal temples of Dame Juno's triumph high, these will allow thee sanctuary, though other it deny. What heavy hap is it that may annoy my guiltless ghost? O oh, mother, O oh, that diamond of the world, that pillar post, whom fate as Jove's lieutenant here have placed for the knowns is dead. And Nessus' burning bane devours Hercules' bones, the daughter the daunter of the British beasts he conquering nights before is conquered now. He mourns, he whirls, wails. What ask ye any more? We wretches love the order of our wretchedness to hear. Tell me the state now of our stock. What countenance doth it bear? O oh, stock, O oh, silly wretched stock, now shall I be esteemed a widow now a cost of now, and now a beggar deemed. Thou dost not languish all alone, for Hercules lies dead, for whom the eyes of all the world have caused their tears to shed. Count not thy fate allotted thee alone. Now all our kind do howl and mourn for him whom thou bewailest in thy mind. Thou sufferest grief, 
the smart whereof belongs to every land, although the sour taste thereof first happened to thy hand, thou careful caitiff dost not wail for Hercules alone. Speak, speak, how nigh to death it was my dear Alcides gone. Death, whom in his own empire he had conquered before, did shrink from him, and fate durst not allow a deed so sore. And Clotho, she perhaps put out her rock with trembling, with trembling arm, as one that hastening Hercules' death did fear to do such harm. O oh day, O oh dismal day, and shall even Hercules the Great pass thus to death? and silent shades unto a worse seat. Is he, think you, already dead? Or may I die before? Speak on, if yet he be not dead. You boa that doth rise, with haughty crest rings everywhere, and Cafar rock likewise divideth Hellespontus sea and turns that side to south, whereas it bides the boisterous blasts of Boreas' windy mouth. Euripus bends his wandering stream and winds in creeks about, his crooked course seven times and doth as often break it out. While Phoebus drenched his weary team amid the western wave, here on a rock above the reach of, a, of clouds a temple brave, of canine Jove's show bright, while all the beasts were sacrificed at the altar stood, and through the wood the noise began to rise, of all the herd, then off he put the mattered lion's case, and likewise did discharge him of his alge and heavy mace, and eased his shoulder from the burthen of his quiver light. Then tucked in your attire, he shone among the people bright, with ugly locks, and on the altar made the fire flame. Receive, quoth he, these fruits, O sire, though fire send the same and not the harvest side, but let with frankincense good store, the fire burn that far the rich Arabian therefore, doth gather out of Saba trees for Phoebus' sacrifice, the earth, quoth he, is now at peace, so be both sea and skies, all beasts be conquered, and I am victor come again, lay down thy lightning leans, O Jove, in fear thou need not reign, in midst of his prayers, thus whereat I was aghast, he fell to sighs and grievous groans, and all the skies at last. With dreadful crying loud he feels, even as the brain-sick bull, when with the axe in wound he scapes, doth fill the temples full of roaring noise. Or as the thunder thrown from heaven doth rumble in the skies, even so the seas and stars of heaven doth Hercules shake with cries. Both Calpe Cliff and Caiclus Isle, well hard his yelling have. have. Here Cafar rocks, there all the woods thereof an echo gave. We saw him weep, the people thought his former frantic fits had now again, as erst they did, bereave him of his wits. His servants scatter then for fear, while he with flaming eyes, all staring stands with steaming looks upon them all he prize. For Lycus, him alone he doth pursue, who in his arm, with trembling hand the altar held and scaped all the harm. By dying first for fainting fear, and while Alcides held, the quaking carcass in his hand, though shout quoth he, he quelled, be quelled. And beaten with this fist of mine, O God's eternal reign, wretch Lycus killeth Hercules and hath his conqueror slain. But lo, another slaughter yet, for Hercules again kills Lycus. Thus the sacrifice of gods with blood they stain. With Lycus thus his labours and thrown up to heaven, they say, that with his dropping blood the clouds he stained all the way even as the pitched dart of Geet with pith doth score the skies, or as the whirling sting of Crete doth get, make the pillar rise. So swift he mounted up to heaven, but down his body dropped, and as his carcass fell among the rocks, his neck it chopped. The grave prepared for their corpse, quoth Hercules, be still, 
I am no brain sick, frantic man, but lo, this de desperate ill. More noisome is than rage of wrath, it calleth much my will. To wreck my rage upon myself, his malady he scant. Be rise, but fareth frantically, and he himself doth rent his limbs, and rifling them with mighty hand asunder tears, and strives to strip himself of all the apparel that he wears. And only this was it, of all the things that I do know, that past the power of Hercules, yet stands he pulling so, and plucketh off his limbs, with all the vesture doth not lin, to bring off lumps of filthy flesh, the shirt sticks to the skin. But what should ail the poison rank, none knoweth what nor why, and yet there is good cause it err of, now grovelling doth he lie, and beats his face against the ground, to water now he hides, but water cannot cool his heat, and now to shore he plies, and for his supper seeks to seize, at length his men him catch, we holding him, alas, the whilst were able him to match. Now in a kneel, now in a keel, amid the seas we launched were aloof, and Hercules' peace was hoisted with a little southern puff. My ghost then left my careful course, and darkness dimmed my sight. Why stay I, wretch? Why doth this dreary deed make me a fright? Her cupfellow, Dame Juno, doth reclaim, and Joe, his son. The world must render him. Then do as much as may be done, and bore my body with a sword. Such sour sauce is due to her, whose cursed caitiff hand her love so lightly slew. O Jove, with fire and lightning flash, destroy thy wretched niece. Let not thy mighty hand be armed with a slender piece. Let brass to the bolt from skies wherewith thou wouldst Hydra burn. If Hercules had been thy son, if Hercules had not been thy son thereof to serve the turn, strike me with uncouth pestilence and with such weapon smite as may be far more irksome plague than all my stepdames spite. Drive forth those deadly darts that earth young Phaeton overthrew, <coughs> when he be full crank and fiery cart about the heavens flew. For thus by slaying Hercules, eke nations slain I have. <coughs> what need thou, Deonair, of gods a tool of death to crave? Now trouble not thy stepsire, Jove. Think scorn may Hercules' wife to wish for death. For to her heart her hand shall set the knife. Dispatch them quickly with the blade, yet let thy blade alone. For who with weapons ends their life, tis long ere they be gone. I will be headlong hurled from a rock as high as skies. The Oeta hill shall be it, where first the sun doth rise. Thence I will throw my body down, the edge of breast and rock shall cleave my corpse, and every crag shall give a bruising knock. My hand shall hang, torn by the way, the rugged mountainside shall be with gushing bubbles of my dropping blood be dyed. On death where were vengeance small, though small yet may be delayed. What desperate death I should attempt, it makes my heart dismayed. Alas, alas, the Hercules sword within my chamber stuck, then well were I if for to die on that it were my luck. It is enough if one right hand do bring us both to grave. Come near, come near ye nations. Now let all people have in readiness both stone and fire the same to throw at me. Now hold your hands and take you to your tools for I am she that of your succor spoiled you now cool Kaisers may all uncontrolled tyrant-like in kingdoms yield the sway. Now every mischief may start up and not rebuke it be. The altars now shall up again that wanted for to see a bloody offering like him, self in kind that offer should. Thus how I made the guilty gap to let in bloodshed bold. I render you to tyrant kings, bugs, beasts, and grisly devils by taking him that should revenge you of these evils. 
O spouse, thou of the thunderer, and can you yet forbear? Wilt thou not fling thy flames from heaven as did thy brother dear? Dispatch me hence, sent up to Jove. Wilt not thou me destroy? The greatest praise that thou might win, then shall thou not enjoy, nor lusty triumph. I am she that bear the name to be the daughter of the man that would in prowess cope with thee. Why wilt thou stain thy stock which hath untainted been before? This ill proceeds of ignorance, although it be full sore. He is not guilty that commits guilt not with his will. Well may he err of ignorance that favoreth his ill and spares himself. Myself of death most worthy I do deem. He doth consent himself to die that needs will guilty seem. Death can, can deceive no one but such as innocence may be. Wilt thou forsake the glorious sun? The sun forsaketh me. Wretch, wilt thou cast away thy life? Yea, though it be to death, I will I follow, will my Hercules. He hath both life and breath. When he perceiveth him or matched, he hasteneth his decay. Wilt thou forego thy son and he prevent thy dying day? Herself hath lived long enough who buried half her child. And wilt thou follow on to death thy spouse? Yea, ladies mild before their husbands used to die. Thyself thou dost accuse of guilt if thou condemn thyself. No guilty one doth use to take revenge of themselves. But those are pardoned still that do offend of ignorance and not of peevish will. Who will condemn the deed he doth? Each man doth seek to shun his lot when spite of frowning fate against him seems to run. And he for whom thou languishest with arrows slow his wife hight Megara and did destroy his tender children's life. When as a brain sick beast in hand he tossed his nary mace that squeezed the snake in Lerna Lake before his father's face. He played thrice the murderer himself, yet he forgave. And for the heinous guilt he did when friends he made him rave. He purged himself in Sinop's spring towards the southern pole and in the water bathed his hand again to make him whole. Now, whether wilt thou recate if wretch, why dost thou damn thy hands? In condemnation of these, of the ghost of Hercules, stand, of, in condemnation of these, the ghost of Hercules stands. I mean to play the treachery. Your Hercules will, I know. Perhaps he will be here again and maester all his woes. Then shall your slaked grief unto your Hercules give place. They say the serpent's poison does devour him apace. The poison of his wicked wife, his lusty limbs, destroys. And think ye to be, think ye it to be the serpent's bane that him annoys, that can he can that he cannot escape who bear the brunt of it alive, and how to pair of hydra's heads he could well full well contrive when as the victor stood with grinning teeth amid the mood and all his body slavered foul with venomous spit and blood. And shall the centaur Nessus gore against the man prevail that made thy pity, that made thy pithy strength itself of Nessus for to quail? In vain he rescued her that is a purpose set to die. Therefore I have determined with myself this life to fly. And long enough he lived that, that may with Hercules die. I do beseech thee humbly for this gray and hoary head, and for these paps that as thy mother thee have nor shed, remove the fervent fits that cage within thy boiling breast, and suffer not these desperate thoughts of death in thee to rest. Who would persuade a wretch to live? He hath a cruel heart, and though that death be unto me a great and grievous smart, yet unto some it is an easing of their pain. O oh, wretch, excuse thy handy work and see at least at last again. Tis ignorance that did the deed and not the willful wife. It will be quit, whereas the infernal fiends shall stint the strife and quit my guilty ghost. My conscience doth my hands condemn. But Pluto, prince of gloomy gulf, shall purge from slaughter them. Before thy banks I will appear 
forgetful Lethe's lake, and being then a doleful ghost, my husband, I will take. But thou that wields the scepter black of dark infernal skies, apply thy toil, the heinous guilt that none durst enterprise. This ignorance hath overcome. Dame Juno never dare to take away our Hercules. Thy plunging plagues prepare. Let Sisyphus stone on my neck force my stooping shoulders shrink and let the fleeting liquor from my gaping gums to sink. Yea, let it mock my thirsty throat when as I mean to drink. And thou that racks Ixion's king of Thessaly, O thou wheel, my heinous hands deserve to have thy swinging sway to feel. And yet the greedy gripe, scratch out these guts on either side. If Dana's pitchers cease, by me the room shall be supplied. Set open hell. Take me, Medea, as partner of thy guilt. This hand of mine, then both of thy more cruel blood hath spilt. Or looking to thy brother's ghost, whose gore hath thee defiled, have with the lady thou of Thrace for such cru a cruel wife, and thee, Althea, that burned the brand of Meleager's life. Receive thy daughter now. Deny me not thy ba to be. Why such a one should quail by you some reason, let us see. Ye honest matrons that enjoy the groves of holy wood, against me shut the heavens, or such whose hands with husband's blood have been imbrued. If any of the 50 sisters dire, defying honest duty, all that wedlock did require. But desperate dames with glory blades stood arm, with gory blades stood arm. In me let them see and allow their bloody hands that other will condemn. I will go and get myself among the troop of cruel wives, but they will shun such guilty hands as shred their husbands' lives. O oh, valiant spouse, a guiltless ghost, but guilty hands I have. O oh, silly woman, woe is me that given like credit have, O oh, traitor Nessus, while I meant by centaurs, subtle charm to draw from Iles Hercules' love, myself sustain the harm. Hence, Phoebus, hence, and thou, O oh, flickering life of her that lacks her Hercules, and Gayest a day of wretches in their racks. This is a dismal day. To these small penance yield I will, and life withal. My woeful fate shall I continue still. Deferring death, O oh spouse, that of thy hand I may be slain. And doth there any spark of life yet in thy breast remain? Or can thy hand yet draw the bow of Samartian shaft to cast? Do weapons cease and have thy feeble hands given up at last to thy bow? But if thy hardy wife to thee a tool may reach, I long to perish of thy hand. Mine hour yet will I stretch, like guiltless Lycus, mangle me, disperse in other towns my corpse, and hurl me to a world beyond the travail's bounds. Trouse me like monster Arcady, or aught that did rebel, and that thou shalt do not but that becomes thy husband well. I pray you, mother, spare yourself, forgive your fatal lot. If ye offend of ignorance, then blame deserve ye not. If thou regard true honesty, thy wretched mother slay. Why trembleth thus my fearful hand? Why look'st thou away? Such sin, such sin shall be a sacrifice. Why, dastard, dost thou fear? I spoiled thy father, Hercules. This hand, this hand, a leer, hath murdered him whereby I have done thee a more despite than joy I did, in that my womb did bring thee first to light. If yet thou know not how to kill, then practice first on me, as if as thou like within my throat thy blade shall sheathed be, or if to paunch thy mother soon thou mean to take in hand to yield her dreadless ghost to thee, thy mother still shall stand. It shall not wholly be thy deed, 
by thee it shall be done, and caused by my will to be. Art thou Alcides' son, and all afraid? So shall thou never great exploits achieve, nor pass the world such feats of arms and slights for to contrive. If any monster should be bred, thy father's courage show, and to it with unfearful arm. Lo, overcharged with woe, my breast lies bare unto thy hand. Strike, I thy guilt forgive. The fiends infernal for thy sin, thy soul shall never breathe. What yerking noise is this we hear? What hag here have we found that bears about her writhen locks these guilty adders wound? And one her irksome temples twain, her blackish sins do wag. Why chase ye me with burning brands, mega a filthy hag? Alcides can but vengeance ask, and that I will him get. But have the judges dire of hell, for it in council set. But of the dreadful dungeon doors, I see the unfolding leaves. What ancient sire is he that on his tattered shoulders heaves? the unwieldy stone that born to the top again doth downward reel? Or what is he that sprawls his limbs upon the whirling wheel? Lo, here stood ugly Tisiphon with stern and ghastly face and did demand the streaming eyes in manner of the case. O oh, spare thy stripes, Megara, spare, and with thy brands away. The offense I did was meant in love and whether I do sway, the ground doth sink, the roof doth crack, whether went this ranging route. Now all the world with gazing eyes stands staring me about. On every side, the people grudge and call for their defense. Be good to me, O nations, whither shall I get me hence? Death only is my load of rest there. May my sorrows bide. I do protest the fiery wheels that Phoebus' chariots guide that here I die and leave the world. There's Hercules yet behind. And exit Dimira. Away she runs aghast, I me. She hath fulfilled her mind. For purpose she was to die and now remains my will, for to prevent her that by force herself she shall not kill. O oh, miserable piety, if I my mother save, I sin against my father then, but if unto the grave I let her go, then toward her a trespass soul there lies. And thus, alas, on either side great mischief doth arise, and needs her purpose be, must be stayed. I'll high and take in hand to stop her desperate enterprise and mischiefy to withstand. Well, true the ditty is that holy Orpheus sang on Thracian harp the sound whereof the roads of Rudder rang, that nothing is created forever to endure. Dame nature's birds each on must stoop when death throws out the lure. The head with crispin locks or golden hairs full in time hath borne an hoary bush or been a naked skull. And that which tracked to time doth bring out of the grain old satin shafts his scythe at length to reap it down again. Though Phoebus rise at morn, the glistering rays full proud, he runs his race and duffeth down, at length in foggy cloud. Doth Gazian's office sang such kind of melody, and how the gods themselves were bound to laws of destiny. God that doth the year by eagle parts depose, how fatal web in every clime in a daily spun he shows for all things made for all things made of mould the ground again will gape as Hercules preacheth plain by proof that nothing can escape for shortly shall ensue the discharges of nature's law and out of hand the gloaming day of doom shall on withdraw then all that lies within the scorching libic lib clime the pole Antarctic of the south shall overwhelm in time. Whole Arctic of the north shall jumble all that lies within the axle tree whereon Tribores blazing flies. 
The shivering sun in heaven shall lease his fading light. The palace of the frames of heavens shall run to ruin quite. And all these blockish gods some kind of death shall quell. And in confused chaos bind, they shall forever dwell. And after ruin made of goblin, hag and elf, death shall bring fine dull destiny at last upon itself. Where shall be then bestowed the world so huge a mass? The beaten highway unto hell is like a way to pass, to lead unto the heavens that shall be laid flat, the space between the heaven and earth. Enough, think ye, is that? Or is it not too, too much for worldly miseries, where may such heaps of sins be lodged, a place above the skies? remains but that the sea with heaven and lower hell three kingdoms cast in one alike within one roof to dwell but hark what roaring cry thus beats my fearful ear no oh, it's hercules that yells tis hercules i hear yes just when you think the play should be over <laughs> uh hercules uh, is dead and uh, the wife has probably just run off and died and uh, no, Hercules is is back, uh, or will be in Act Four, uh, which we'll look at next time. Um, there's some there's some nice there's some nice sort of despair, sort of almost or of, of, oh, are these furies I see coming for me and my soul uh, stuff in there um, that I, I I was quite quite enjoying. Um, and again, it's this thing we almost get dialogue. We we get these occasional bursts of dialogue when people actually talk to each other, um, but then they're still speechifying at each other. Um, but it does some, um, you know, we do have a sort of sense of the plot as, uh, you know, that that we have a, a a unit of action that has been completed here. That it's like uh, the play should end, but no, the play is going to continue. More more action is going to occur. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left before we uh, we run out of time. Um, so final thoughts around the room, uh, relatively brief. Uh, Eric, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, having read this, well, nearly twice. Um, this is my second time around because of the editing. I, I yeah. It's very much like tragedy of Miriam. We think Herod is dead, but he's not. Surprise! Uh, but except that the difference is that I, by this point, I was hoping that Hercules was dead. I think just because I wanted it to be shorter. But I mean, that's just me. Uh, th that's me being mean. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting the way it's set up. Um, sort of, is he dead? We don't know if he's dead. Um, whereas nowadays, we'd probably, I mean, with modern technology and fake news we'd probably be sort of you know trying to be, take pictures of his corpse or you know the funeral just to make sure mm. well of course in this situation he's, he's dead but that doesn't necessarily mean he hasn't stopped moving yet uh elizabeth any final thoughts yeah i wanted to say like good on nutrix she seems to kind of save the day she kind of knew all along i feel like she kind of knew um, she was very good at all, getting Dianara to like stop and wait and and don't go too far. I love that relationship between Neutrix and Dianara. Um, I'm really enjoying it, enjoying the text actually. I don't think I was thinking about how hard it is it would be to learn these lines mm. for for a performance. Like I was just thinking that like, this is not an actor's play. This is more of a listener's plays more of an audio ad adaptation which beyond shakespeare does really well actually um i'd love to listen to it i don't think i'd like to watch it so much mm. i think that is a very very fair assessment <laughs> <laughs> alan any final thoughts i'm trying to get my breath back after that last uh, speech i mean it, it does have some huge bleeding great chunks of text for each individual and very very few bits of dialogue mm. or interaction um you know which again probably comes back to this design to be read rather than performed um you know i'm i'm just wondering whether it was actually ever intended to be read aloud mm. <clears throat> but when... um 
you know, and, and I did have a slightly cynical thought that Ben Johnson was probably paying attention to this on the basis of uh, why use five words when 500 will do better. <laughs> uh, Bryony, you draw, drew the short straw. You get to be Hercules next time, so uh, you you uh, get a lot more next time uh, to read. Uh, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's so dense. It's a lot to take in, um, and it can be quite hard to follow at times, especially like you say, because they're talking a lot about mythology, things that have happened that aren't necessarily directly relating to the plot that we're dealing with. Um, but some of the language is really lovely. Uh, I'm enjoying the verse and the way it, it sort of changes. That last bit, I wonder whether whether it's just the way it's been laid out in our script or whether that could potentially have been a song. Um, it might, be, might have been quite nice to have a little song in there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's always that question about choruses. You know, uh, how choric do you go with the chorus? Is is it a single speaker, or are they? Uh, is is the author thinking that maybe there might be multiple speakers, and that yes, you could uh, go go all the way back to Greece and uh, and make it proper sing song. Um, yeah, that, that I mean, there, there are questions there, uh, Lynn. Oh, yeah. I, the only response I have is like, yes, this is definitely written to be read aloud. Um, I mean, reading aloud is a much more common practice in the past, even the fairly recent past than it is now. And the the, the rhyming and the alliteration, I think, signal to me clearly that this is a this is a musical text. Um, even though, as with many translations, the the rhyme, the the necessity for rhyme, um, forces English into some weird syntax. So parsing that can be really hard um so i i for one was saying a lot of stuff that i did not know what i was talking about mm. <laughs> where's the main verb here no idea um <laughs> so you know and look the direct object is the first thing in the sentence and the subject is the last oh that's unusual <laughs> um, uh, but i you know i think actually it might have a really lovely sound if you um uh if you familiarize yourself with it and we're able to like go through and punctuate and parse the grammar um so that you you knew where the phrasing the breaks in in syntactical units came um i think it's actually quite musical hmm yeah i mean i, I think there's there is this uh, element actually that you know, one of the things i really want to get to grips with is actually um various uh workings with 14ers of you know really getting used to it because it's that, that thing of it every time we sort of rock up to a 14er after a break of a, a month or so and it's and and it's like uh, it has a a, a a a gravity well of its own that you you sometimes have to sort of embrace and sometimes you have to sort of fight against and and uh, some writers do 14ers better than others and it's it's just not a verse form that we use enough to really get into it naturally to be able to do some sustained work on it uh so that you know uh, it feels comfortable rather than what is yeah. this this strange uh 14er yeah. thing what do you give us um uh, eric and then i'm i'm gonna close the session well also with 14ers it's weird because like this version well this text i mean not this version has very um distinct rhymes so it's kind of hard to resist it even when mm. the sentence does not end at the end of the line and you're like mm. wait no that doesn't no yeah. where does the comma go or where does the full stop go here mm. it kind of yeah punctuation is part. yeah uh but uh, all that is for future people to worry about at this stage they might be us future people but we, who knows who knows it might be you it could be you uh all that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading thank you very much everyone and goodbye with a thumping thwack <laughs> 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 <laughs>